In this video, I will be talking about air masses and weather fronts. These concepts provide a nice link between our work with air parcels and lapse rates and understanding the weather data that we have collected. We should be able to understand and interpret weather maps that we see and hear on forecasts after listening to this video. Our work with lapse rate involves thinking about air parcels. These images show the different models that we use to evaluate adiabatic cooling and heating of air and the relative stability of these packages as compared to the environmental lapse rate. These were clearly abstractions. Now we will put some reality to these air parcels by talking about actual air masses and the boundaries between the air masses, which are called weather fronts. Here is a map that shows contoured pressure values. What do you notice about the high pressure area located here? Well, the first thing is that it dominates a large part of North America. This is a continental polar air mass that brought cold air from Canada, producing dangerously cold temperatures for most of the country. This weather pattern wrecked havoc for farmers in the southeast as crops are subjected to sub-freezing temperatures. Was the air sinking or rising within this air parcel? Sinking, right? The pressure was high, therefore air is converging to the surface. Which direction is the wind rotating? From our work on winds, we know that air rotates clockwise around high pressure centers. Are there any ridges or troughs? Here is a prominent high pressure ridge. The top number for all of these sites is the air temperature. The bottom is the dew point. Is the relatively, relative humidity high or low? High, right? Because those values are so close. But since the air is so cold, there's not much moisture, so it actually would feel pretty dry. Let's move on now and talk about the different types of air masses. We are going to concentrate on North American air masses, with apologies to our overseas colleagues. There are eight different air masses that affect North American weather. Air masses are defined as extremely large bodies of air that have approximately the same temperature and humidity, and are fairly similar in any horizontal direction for a given altitude. Air masses originate in source regions that are relatively flat where air can sit for periods of time and assume the properties of the surface. These areas are usually zones of high pressure and include the ice and snow-covered Arctic regions in winter and the subtropical areas in summer. The middle latitudes where these air masses meet are not good areas for ma air mass development but are the locations where the air masses clash producing dramatic weather changes. Air masses are defined by their source region and the humidity and temperature values. On land, land air masses are referred to as continental, little c, and can form in the Arctic, extremely cold, dry, and stable, polar areas, cold, dry, and stable, or tropical areas hot, dry, and stable aloft, but unstable at the surface. Clearly, the Arctic and polar masses dominate during the winter months. In the continental tropical, is a summer phenomenon that is responsible for the rainy monsoon season in the southwestern United States. Air masses that form over water are called maritime, lalem. These include maritime polar, cool, moist, and unstable, and maritime tropical, warm, moist, and unstable. Now we'll look at examples of each of these air masses. Let's first look at a couple of examples of continental Arctic air masses. 
Extremely cold and stable conditions are associated with continental Arctic air masses. This map shows the path of two such masses, one in December of 1990 and one of December in 1989. Note the location of all the high pressure zones. Also note that sub-freezing temperatures are, all the, are found all the way down into Florida, a really cold air mass. This weather map showing contours, locations of fronts, and certain weather station data shows an example of what is referred to as the Siberian, Siberian Express, an extremely cold air mass that covered the U.S. in 1983 and 84. This is a huge high pressure ridge that extends all the way from northern Canada, from southern Canada down to Louisiana. Note the low temperatures, the low relative humidity, and clockwise rotation of the winds. The white areas show zones of snowfall. In the Rockies, this band is due to the approach of a slow moving weather front. In the Great Lakes area, this snow is referred to as is called lake effect snow because of the high accumulations around the Great Lakes. Also note the high pressures recorded in Montana, 1,064 millibars, which is the highest pressure recorded in the U.S., excluding Alaska. Next, an example of continental polar air mass. An example of continental air, polar air masses is shown in this image. Cold, dry air is pushing in from Canada across the United States. There, cold air meets the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico and the warm waters of the Gulf Stream. This is where precipitation and clouds, or clouds and precipitation, occur. Note that the clouds off the east coast are mostly cirrus, as shown here whereas the prominent brand of more consistent stratus clouds mark the location of the Gulf Stream, shown here. Still talking about continental polar air masses, we've already learned about environmental lap rates. Here are two graphs, or two lines, that show the lap rate for continental polar air masses in the summer and continental polar masses in the winter. Note that they're pretty different. In the winter, the ELR has a prominent inversion where the temperature increases with height due to the warmer land surface, but due to the lower amount of energy during the winter, this is not enough to eliminate the inversion. However, in the summer, the continental polar air mass usually means nicer weather with lower humidity and temperatures. Due to the increase in energy during the warm months, the inversion does not form. Now let's move on to maritime air masses, the, those that form over water. This is an example of a maritime polar air mass that forms a low pressure area off the west coast, bringing abundant rain to the Pacific Northwest in California and snows to the mountains. Typically moisture is dumped over the mountain ranges, the coast range and the Cascades in the Pacific Northwest and the Sierra Nevada in California. So as the air moves to the east it is significantly drier. Note that the circulation around the low is counterclockwise. Here is an image of a maritime polar mass that is typical of spring weather along the east coast. The high pressure area has relatively low water vapor content. Note the rotation sense for the air, clockwise. Inclement weather develop, develops along a stationary front in the middle Atlantic states where the cold air meets warm moist air forming a band of showers freezing rain, and light snow. So 
So we are done with the cold air masses, the Arctic and polar air masses. Maritime masses form over the Pacific, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic and Caribbean areas. In the summer, a smaller continental tropical air mass forms over Mexico due to rising hot air, which for the desert southwest hopefully bodes well for summer monsoon rains. First, let's look at maritime tropical air masses. The Pineapple Express is a significant maritime tropical air mass that occasionally forms over the Pacific during the winter seasons, bringing heavy rain and drenching rain to California and the Pacific Northwest. This satellite image shows a Pineapple Express system developed in 1997 that brought significant rains which damaged the National Park, Yosemite National Park. This map shows a maritime tropical air mass produced in the Gulf of Mexico that brought warm, humid air to most of the East Coast, resulting in very high temperatures and humidity in April of 1976. Note the boundary between the air masses is the location of a frontal system with a prominent low pressure area. Finally, this slide shows a weather map for a continental tropical air mass in July of 2005 that resulted in very hot conditions in the desert southwest, southwest. Because it was a high pressure system, this system did not bring any moisture, resulting in the very hot and dry conditions. We are now on to weather fronts. Air masses are fine and good, but the real weather action occurs at the boundary between air masses. This is where air masses of different temperature and humidity clash, resulting in the development of some very interesting weather phenomena. This weather map shows a lot of information. The location of polar, of maritime polar and continental polar air masses. Three different types of fronts, shown one, two, three, four different types of fronts, as shown here in the key. Location of pressure areas, high pressure and low pressure areas, contours of the pressure values, wind direction and wind speed, and cloud cover. Take a look at the wind and direction and magnitude symbols. Do these make sense in terms of the directions and magnitude for the different pressure systems? More weather action. This is a Doppler radar image that shows the location of precipitation along a weather front. This is a cold front as cold air from the northwest clashes with the warm air to the southeast. Note the prominent bands of yellow and green splotches. These are areas of light to moderate rain. The red areas are likely areas of strong thunder and lightning storms and possibly hail. There are only four types of fronts. Cold fronts, warm fronts, stationary fronts, and occluded fronts. The ornament on the front line indicates the direction the front is moving. Note that the stationary fronts are, well, not moving, and they have ornaments on both sides of the front line. We will not be talking about the stationary fronts. Of special mention, though, is each of these fronts has a characteristic weather system and sequence of cloud formation. So even just observing clouds will allow you to make predictions about the nature of the fronts that are moving into an area. First, cold fronts. Cold fronts occur when cold air mashes, a cold air mass clashes with the warm air mass, as shown in this slide. This forces the warm air to rise, adding to the warm air's tendency to al already rise adiabatically. Ahead of the front, cirrus and cirrostratus cloud form and right at the front, alto cumulus and cumulonimbus clouds are prevalent and associated with a precipitation event, usually rain. Note the winds at high latitude push the warm air ahead of the front. Before the front, the temperature would be warm and the pressure falling steadily, and there would be increasing cloudiness, 
starting with high-level cirrus clouds. There may be periods of showers with a high, steady dew point. As the front passes an area, the winds would be gusty and shifting, the temperature would drop, and the pressure would drop to a minimum and then sharply rise because of the cold air. There would be large cumulonimbus clouds, heavy showers, with or without thunder, lightning, and hail, and a sharp drop in the dew point. After the front has passed, the wind would be shifting from the west-northwest, temperature would drop because of the cold air, pressures rise, cumulus clouds would form at a lower elevation, and there may be some showers. Also, the dew point would lower because of the lack or the decrease in moisture. Here is a warm front. In this model, warm air rises over a receding cold air mass. As the air rises, clouds form with a significant precipitation of rain, sleet, or snow, depending on the temperature. Note the different cloud types that form, with cirrus and stratus far ahead of the front, and nimbostratus and stratus associated with precipitation closer to the front. On this model, the lapse rate shown here is superimposed. Note the temperature inversion above the boundary between the cold receding air and the warm ensuing air. That creates the inversion that's commonly associated with warm fronts. Here's what to expect from the movement of a warm front. Before the warm front moves in, the wind should be from the south to southeast, cooling but warming temperatures and falling pressure. There's a specific order of cloud as shown in this slide in this table. There should be light to moderate precipitation ahead of the front, and the type depends on the temperature, and a, there also should be a steady rise in the dew point because the vapor, amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is increasing. As the warm front passes an area, variable winds are developed, a rise in temperature because we're getting warm air, and pressure levels, pressure levels should, pressure should level off or drop. Stratus clouds will form and there may be a small amount of precipitation, although the dew point is relatively steady. After passing, the, the weather should be south to southwest winds with warmer temperatures, a slight rise in temperatures, pressures, clearing with some stratocumulus clouds and usually no precipitation and a rise in the dew point. The final type of front is the occluded front, which form when a cold front catches up and overtakes a warm front. These types of fronts are usually part of a much larger process that is called a middle latitude cyclone which was covered in your jet streams chapter and will be the subject of a short lecture for next week. The weather associated with an occluded front is similar to a warm front. A special case of air clashing is the formation of tornadoes, some of the most dangerous and spectacular weather phenomena. The inset map shows the number of tornadoes in each state between 1991 and 2010. Note that the majority of them fall along the mid-continental area, a zone called Tornado Alley. And aren't those really cool pictures of tornadoes? This is a schematic weather map that shows a setup for tornado formation. In the Midwest, most tornadoes form between May and June although lately they've been a lot in September and even later into the fall. The requirements for tornado formation is moist air moving north along a warm front coupled with cold dry air moving south along a cold front. Tomato, tomato, tornadoes form along what's called a squall line which is shown in this brown dash line due to the rapid rising of the air and shear winds from the jet stream that cause the winds to twist. This slide shows a 3D model of the frontal geometries, types of clouds that form, location of precipitation events, and different components 
of a tornado producing system. A special note here is the location of these fronts. A cold, a warm front coupled with a cold front mixing in this area to produce large or a rapid rise in the warm moist air and production of the significant clouds and tornadoes. I hope this lecture gives you the knowledge to complete the exercise on the weather maps and fronts. Good luck and please let me know if you have any questions.